thank you, first of all, to Patrick Mulvani and the uh, UK Food Group for their invitation uh, to summarize in 20 minutes uh, what I've been doing over the past five years and a half. Um, let me summarize this uh, uh, really by, by trying to remember where we come from and where the food systems we inherit from um, come from. Um, these systems have really grown uh, to be shaped as they are in the 1950s and 60s based on one major preoccupation. And that preoccupation was to boost production in order to satisfy growing demand in a context in which demographic growth was very strong and in which the productivity of agriculture was relatively low and, and not um, making uh, progress uh, swiftly enough. In 1965, we had actually reached a peak in terms of demographic growth. Uh, at the time, the population in the world was increasing by 2.5% each year, which is um, uh, almost double what it is now, since we now have a population growth of 1.4%. At the time, we had large regions that were underperforming in terms of agricultural yields, and the productivity of agriculture was um, insufficiently um, uh, fast in making progress to, to cope with this um, increasing demand. And so in the West, um, in the Global South, uh, the preoccupation was in the 50s and 60s to, to boost production and to reward economies of scale, to reward bigness, uh, to reward efficiency above everything else. Uh, judged by its own terms, this has been a very successful story. Over the past 50 years, agricultural productivity increased 2.1% every year. And very soon, we managed to increase agricultural productivity much faster than population itself, since the rate of population growth was declining at the same time. But 50 years later, um, after the Common Agricultural Policy uh, was launched in the early 1960s, after in the US, uh, a, a big push was made to support uh, the production of large-scale cereals and, and soybean. After the Green Revolutions in, in Latin America in the 50s and in South Asia in the 60s, what is left? What we find today is that the answers that were given to the problems as they were understood in the 50s and 60s are not the answers that um, are adequate for today's questions. And the food systems have succeeded in boosting yields, but failed on a number of other fronts. And let me um, um, identify perhaps five key areas in which uh, the, um, the glass is still very much um, um, half empty. Firstly, uh, hunger has not been significantly reduced. Um, those of you who are fond, as I am myself, of reading uh, reports by UN agencies, you may have <laughs> You may have in mind um, the figure of 842 million people who are undernourished. Uh, this is a, a, a gross underestimate of the reality of the problem of hunger in the world. Um, the reason why it's a very serious underestimation is because this is only a measurement of um, an estimated um, lack of calorie availability uh, throughout the year, and um, it is based on a presumption that um, the poor need a, a certain number of calories that correspond to what people need for sedentary lifestyles. Now, we know that many poor people um, perform demanding physical labor. We also know that um, short-term um, food insecurity, short-term um, um, obstacles in having access to food may have very serious long-term consequences, particularly for the children's uh, physical and mental development. And so, whilst this figure measures undernourishment in the most extreme sense of one year long um, lack of calorie availability if you have a sedentary lifestyle, it is significantly below the reality of the problem. The reality is we have today maybe 1.2 or 1.3 billion people who are still underfed. And that figure, has not been significantly reduced over the years. Yes, the proportion of hungry people in the world has been declining, 
but we still have a very persistent problem of extreme poverty of people unable to feed themselves because of an insufficient purchasing power. And the official figures about declining hunger are ones to be treated with great caution. Secondly, um, it is not enough to provide people with cheap calories. It's also um, important to pay greater attention to the quality of diets. And here the failure, I think everybody recognizes, has been massive. We have two billion people in the world who suffer from various types of micronutrient deficiencies, who lack zinc, uh, um, uh, iodine, uh, um, iron, uh, uh, various uh, vitamins or, or essential minerals. And as a result of this, we have um, uh, people in, uh, affected by diseases which could be prevented by more healthy, more adequate diets. In addition, we have result in a widespread development of non-communicable diseases linked to overweight, obesity, imbalanced diets. Um, uh, the figures are figures you are familiar with. 400 million people are obese in the world today. One billion other are um, um, overweight. And uh, obesity is uh, reducing life expectancy and is the source of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, um, various non-communicable diseases that are linked to inadequate diets combined with the shift to more sedentary lifestyles. That's a second failure, a failure to integrate nutrition concerns in the kind of uh, food that is produced, because instead of encouraging people to produce food, we've encouraged them to produce commodities for large markets as convenient inputs for the agribusiness industry. Thirdly, the third failure is, um, of course, at the environmental level. In the 50s and 60s, that was not seen as a major concern. Yet, um, agro-industrial production has been the source of um, a huge dependency on, on fossil fuel for the production of food. It's been accelerating uh, erosion and land degradation as a result of monocultures uh, spreading all over. It's been a result of the pollution, it's, it's been resulting in the pollution of water sources and of soils because of the huge, um, uh, often excessive use of nitrogen-based fertilizers and, and pesticides um, on the field. The mechanization of production has, of course, allowed the food systems to be um, um, less intensive in labor and in a certain way more competitive, uh, but they have had um, uh, very problematic impacts by encouraging monocultures and creating this de dependency on, on fossil fuels um, for, the, for the future. Um, a fourth impact of the systems as they've developed um, is on the use of, of resources, the, the efficiency with which we use resources. Um, as Patrick Mulvani very kindly um, uh, reminded us, I produced a report on, on the fishing industry and the right to food and how um, fishing had been, had been developing, the new techniques that were being used, uh, the subsidies that were going to, to subsidizing industrial fishing uh, methods and the competition between small-scale artisanal fishers on one hand and large industrial fish trailers on the other hand. And in that report, I identify overfishing, inter alia by the use of new fishing techniques, as a very serious problem as fish stocks are being depleted, a problem that is, of course, magnified by climate change and uh, the acidification of oceans. Now, I regret that there's one report I have not written, maybe in the future, and that is on industrial livestock. My final report, however, shall be quite comprehensive on that issue, very much in parallel to the issue of fishing. Industrial livestock production is unsustainable from the environmental point of view and is diverting scarce resources in terms of cereals produced to feeding livestock in ways that are completely inefficient. Just picture that by 2050, 50% of cereals produced in the world will go to feeding animals. Um, in um, a report prepared in 2009, the FAO projected that whilst in 2005, 2007, we, we were producing some 200 million tons of meat per year, to match the growing demand for meat, we would need to produce 470 million tons, um, more than doubling uh, the, the current levels of production. That, to me, is entirely unsustainable. And I believe that although there are ways to produce meat more efficiently, um, with a less important ecological uh, uh, footprint or 
uh, or, or Hoofprint, as, as uh, some have written, um, there's no other way than to reduce the consumption of meat. Um, in our countries, in the EU, uh, the average um, consumption of meat per person is about 95 kilograms per year per person. It's 120 in, in the US, in Australia, in New Zealand. Um, it is 60 in China. We should um, move towards some 30, 33 kilograms per year per person as a global average for meat production to be, to be sustainable given the resources that, uh, that we have. And it is an issue that in my final report I, I spend some time on. Um, fifth and finally, the food systems that have developed under this productivist paradigm of the 50s and 60s are food systems that have not been equitable from the point of view of their impacts on respective levels of incomes in rural areas in developing countries. In the north, of course, we know that they've led to the disappearance of many small farms and the depopulation of rural areas. In the south, the consequences have been even much more dramatic because the farmers that have been displaced, the small farmers that um, could not be um, 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 uh, winning in the system rewarding the most competitive producers, these farmers have not been given any alternative because of a lack of qualifications and because of insufficient employment opportunities being created in the services and the industry sectors. These farmers have basically been confined to subsistence agriculture because of a lack of support to small-scale family farming. And it is still uh, there in the rural areas and developing countries that um, extreme poverty is most widespread. The reason for this is very simple. Um, we've been focusing on economies of scale, on efficiency, on global markets being provided with enough stuff for the food industry to, to respond to, to demand, and we've forgotten about the need for agriculture to also contribute to rural development and the reduction of rural poverty. Um, the result is that many poor countries have been caught into a sort of vicious cycle as more and more impoverished farmers were forced to migrate to the cities. And this began in the 60s and was accelerated in the 1980s as the states retreated from agriculture under structural adjustment programs. The governments in these countries had no choice but to import more subsidized food from international markets, heavily subsidized by OECD taxpayers' money. And it was for them a very convenient solution to um, develop this addiction to cheap food dumped on international markets as a result of our policies in the North, not least the common agricultural policy in the, in the EU. It was more difficult, it was more costly, it was less politically uh, rewarding for them to support their small farmers, and so the cheap option was to increase this dependency on imports. The result, between 1990 and 2008, the average food bills of the least developed countries, the 48 poorest countries on Earth, have been increasing by 400, 500%, multiplied by five or six um, over, the over the past uh, um, 18, 20 years. Um, that is a very significant um, issue that leads these countries to be now extremely vulnerable to volatile prices on international markets themselves, uh, the results of um, um, the price volatility of energy and of climate shocks that shall be repeating themselves in the future. In other terms, Yes, we've succeeded in doing one thing, which is to increase the production of food per capita, but we failed on many other grounds. Yet, these are the areas which now should become the focus of our attention. And even though the Green Revolution might have avoided famines in the 60s, even though there were reasons to be concerned with low productivity in agriculture in the 50s and 60s, as indeed we were, the answers that were valid 60 years ago are not answers that are still valid for the 21st century. Today, we demand from food systems something else, not just to, to cope with increasing demand, as they must, as they do. We today, we today produce the equivalent of 4,800 kilocalories um, of food per capita. Most of this gets either wasted or goes to feeding animals and is not used for human consumption, however. Um, but the food systems must deliver something else. They must deliver, first of all, on, on the environment, on, on supporting and, 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 and preserving um, 
the, the ecosystems on which we rely for the future. And, and the first priority that should be set for them today is to shift to sustainable production. I produced in 2010, I believe it was, a report on agroecology and the right to food. And it's a report that tries to show that resource efficiency, not just improve labor productivity, but resource efficiency should be a key priority in the future. Uh, many people dismiss agroecology as a dream of the romantics, um, um, as a return to the past, as a nostalgia for the agriculture of the grandparents. No, it's agriculture for the future. I very much hope and I believe it shall be the kind of knowledge intensive agriculture that our children will be performing because they will have no choice and much better to prepare this shift than to have to operate it, operate it under the pressure of crisis. Agroecology is a, is a sustainable way of producing food by understanding how nature works, by understanding the interactions between trees, plants and animals, by replicating at tree level the natural complementarities that we see in the, in the natural systems. And it is demanding because it requires training, it requires knowledge, it requires uh, contextualized solutions and it, it requires knowledge to be spread from farmer to farmer in horizontal ways rather than techniques being imposed top down. But it is the future and it is certainly for um, poor farmers in the global south who cannot afford to mortgage their land and to buy um, at high prices their inputs. It is certainly a more sustainable and less expensive way of practicing farming. A second um, uh, demand that um, we have today for food systems is a demand for sustainable consumption. This has largely been a taboo. Um, yes, sustainable consumption was referred to in the, um, the Rio Declaration adopted in, in 1992. Uh, it was reiterated much more powerfully in, in Rio Plus 20, the conference on, uh, on uh, sustainable development that took place in June 2012 but it still is largely unaddressed. And let me take three examples. Um, first, overconsumption of meat in rich countries, um, which is only possible because we have the purchasing power in Europe, in the US, um, increasingly elsewhere, that allows these populations to use massive areas of land and water that exist in the global south to feed their increasing demand for meat. If we had a more equitable distribution of resources, we would not have the luxury demands of the richest compete against the basic needs of the poorest. Yet that is what is happening in a globalized food system in which um, um, people compete for, for land, uh, water, um, as we see when we look at the huge impacts of soybean production, for example, on the Latin American continent to feed animals in the, in the global north. Um, a second illustration of this is, of course, uh, the increased demand for liquid biofuels. Um, that is a battle, unfortunately, I, that still is to be won, right? I was going to say it's lost. No, not at all. It still is to be won. Um, but it is a failure because here we have um, a politics that have trumped uh, 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 science and, and, and common sense that has been, that has been uh, forgotten. In the, in the process. Um, Agroenergy, I believe, is something that has much to deliver to reduce the dependency on fossil fuel in, in poor countries. But liquid biofuels for transport, when it feeds in ethanol and biodiesel the cars in the, in the US and, and in the EU, is something extremely problematic because of the pressure on land it results in, because of the shift to export-led agriculture that it encourages, and because, again, it, it leads the luxury demands of the North to, to be pit against the, the basic needs of the South in, in the access to basic resources that, that they need. A third example um, uh, as regards sustainable consumption is, of course, the need to address much more than we have in the past food waste and inefficiencies in the food systems. Um, it is estimated that we lose, we waste some 1.3 billion tons of food every year, um, about half in the north and half in the global south for very different reasons. 
And to give you an idea of how much this represents, this is more than half the total production of cereals um, any year. We produce annually roughly 2.4 billion tons of cereals every year. So that's the amount of food that we lose. Now, for very different reasons, as I said, in developing countries and in, in rich countries. Um, in rich countries, it's in the food processing industry. It's um, at household level, of course, that we waste lost, lots of food. Some 120 kilograms per year per person in the EU, for example. Um, in the South, it's of course at the field level primarily as a result of a lack of storage facilities, processing facilities, um, transport facilities to make sure that the food, that the crops, once they are um, uh, collected, can be um, sold on markets and processed uh, speedily enough not to be wasted. Um, so we need much more investment to reduce losses wastes in the food systems because there's a huge leakage and we could do much more about this. Why have we not done much about this? Well, because it's probably not very promising as a market. Um, it's probably not very interesting to many major economic actors to support um, that, uh, although it would be the, a, a very um, economical way um, to addressing uh, what some fear uh, is a mismatch between supply and, um, and demand. Um, so, sustainable production, sustainable consumption, and, and finally, the reduction of poverty. I think um, um, we have to um, take into account the fact that unless we support small farmers in the global south much better, poverty will continue in the rural areas in global south, the rural to urban migration will continue, and this vicious cycle I've been describing that is characteristic of the situation of many poor countries will continue to make obstacles to change. Now, here there was a real debate as to what is best for small farmers. And um, I believe that um, we should pursue in parallel two reform programs that support, that is what is common to them, the real choice of farmers. Let me explain. One reform program is to reshape the food systems so that they are more hospitable to small-scale farmers, allowing them, yes, access to seeds, allowing them um, to be better integrated in supply chains, allowing them to not to be cheated by the large actors from the agribusiness industry. And this issue of power relationships in the food systems is one completely forgotten in international summits about hunger, despite its key strategic importance. We must allow farmers wishing to um, join the, the, the dominant, the mainstream food systems to do so in much better conditions than they have in the past. Mostly they've been excluded from these systems which have not been shaped for them, but have been shaped for relatively larger uh, producers. At the same time, many small farmers are not interested in joining these food systems. They want something else. They don't want better access to commercially bred seeds. They want to use their own land races. They want to have um, um, seed banks. They want to have seed fairs. They want to um, cultivate according to the local agroecological conditions of the zones in which they operate. They want not to join global supply chains. They're interested in selling on the local markets to feeding their families and communities. And we must allow that also. Real choice means Neither of these two alternatives should be impossible for farmers it's to feeding their families and communities, and we must allow that also. Real choice means neither of these two alternatives should be impossible for farmers to choose, and I believe freedom of choice should be our um, uh, objective, which means not relegating uh, farmers to um, 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 low-income um, uh, markets and to... And to um, um, and relegating them to subsistence agriculture, but not um, uh, obliging them either to join the mainstream food systems uh, if they want to do something else. And I'm, I'm happy to have an exchange with you as to how these two reform programs can be made compatible with one another, as I believe they should and, and can. So the key problem is, of course, how to achieve this, because much of what I've said, many people agree. And certainly many scientists um, studying the food systems in a dispassionate fashion um, would share this diagnosis I've proposed. 
But the key question is, which are the leveraged points we can actionate to make change happen? And here let me uh, propose that there is a, a difficulty in making the transition we need because of the interdependence, interdependence of reforms in the global south and in rich countries. Why? In poor agricultural-based um, um, countries, particularly the, the least developed countries, we need to rebuild local food systems, reinvest in small-scale farming, reconnect small farmers to local markets um, for the benefit not only of these farmers, but for the benefit also of the other sectors of the, of the economy and for the benefit of the urban populations who have a right to fresh, nutritious, locally produced food instead of having to depend on the processed foods on the shelves of the supermarkets. However, that shift in developing countries is made very difficult because of the policies that we have here. I mean, not here in the friend's house, but, but, but here in the rich countries. Um, we still have policies that reward bigness, that rewards economies of scale, that encourage farmers to produce not food but commodities, and in which there are many lock-ins in the system making transitions extremely difficult to effectuate. And I see essentially four lock-ins. One is um, social technical. We have infrastructures, storage facilities, um, communication um, um, routes, um, technologies that reward the big agribusiness corporations and a food system that relies on heavily processed foods and, and long food chains. Social technical obstacles. We have social economic obstacles. We have very efficient large-scale producers who, of course, um, continuously grow, occupy dominant positions in the food systems, and marginalize smaller-scale producers. So we have a social economic lock-in. We have, thirdly, a social cultural lock-in. Many families are now forgetting how to cook. Even if they were given um, access to fresh, cheap, affordable, vegetables, they would not know what to do with them. They rely on the local grocery stores and the, and the, and the, um, and, and, and the microwavable options that are proposed to them. So that is going to be very difficult it's a, to change. It's a, it's a third lock-in I see in our consumption practices in, in reconnecting people to the, to the uh, locally produced uh, fresh nutritious foods that they almost have forgotten uh, they ultimately depend on. And fourthly, we have a social political um, um, uh, obstacle. The dominant players in the system who've been benefiting for many years now are so dominant that they occupy veto positions in the political system, making change extremely difficult to achieve um, and resulting in a situation in which the food systems do not respond either to science or to what people demand, but respond to the most effective lobbyists in, in Brussels or in the city of London. Lock-ins are real. To overcome them, we need more democracy. And without democracy in the food systems, we will get nowhere. And I think one key contribution the right to food has to make is in allowing us to overcome these lock-ins in the system, allowing us to have food policies that are more transparent, better informed by what people not just demand, but the solutions they have to offer from their local experiments in rebuilding local food systems. This is why I put many hopes in uh, food policy councils developing. I put many hopes in municipalities taking interest in farmers' markets developing, in, in school feeding programs developing, in local school canteens um, buying from local producers. I think much can be done at the local level to rebuild some sense of ownership of the food systems and, and ensuring that solutions can, can emerge from people understanding the local resources they can mobilize to rebuild local food systems that have largely been um, underdeveloped in the past uh, 50, 60 years. But local food systems are not going to be able to thrive, to prosper, unless we have national level policies that are in place and that enable these local food systems to flourish and to emerge. And yes, I dedicated some of my work to working on these national food policies that we need. It's true for developing countries, of course. It's also true for countries such as Canada that I could study in depth, or, or the US, where I spent quite some time over, over the past few years, um, who have no food policy. 
and where the food policy is actually an agricultural policy. Um, you know, Orwell had imagined in 1984 this, um, this ministry of plenty. Well, the USDA is a ministry of plenty. It must transform itself into a ministry of well-being. And thirdly, we need an enabling international environment. Um, I think it's very difficult for countries to make a shift, to make the transition we need, unless the international environment is made more supportive of these efforts. That means, in particular, aligning trade policies, aligning investment policies, aligning food aid policies with the need to rebuild local food systems to support social movements that invent local solutions that can be scaled out from place to place and, and, and be replicated across different, um, different contexts. Um, we need uh, to ensure that the various policies that shape the international environment converge uh, towards the realization of the right to food. The place where this can happen is the Committee on World Food Security, uh, on which uh, someone like Nora McKeon has, has invested so much, so much energy, because that is where democracy can be achieved in reshaping the global food security agenda. Uh, but there is today a very strong um, competition um, to define which forum shall be taking the lead in shaping the food agenda for the 21st century. So this is um, what um, I hope my, my successor will be able to pursue. Thank you. It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce our next speaker. In uh, June, it was, I think, uh, Via Campesina had its sixth international conference in Jakarta. And uh, during the course of that conference, there was one of the most wonderful mysticas of La Via I've ever seen where the baton of the Secretariat, the International Secretariat, passed from the Indonesian Secretariat, Henry Saragi, to the new Zimbabwean Secretariat with Elizabeth Borfu. I'm sure there are lots of iPhone videos all around the world with pictures of this ceremony, which was done with such great sensitivity and also with great uh, purpose of showing how this growing international peasant movement of La Via Campesina has the strength to be able to shift its organization from continent to continent, first in Latin America, then in Southeast Asia, and now in Africa, at a particularly critical time when this contest that Olivia was describing about, in terms of determining what the food system is about and how it should be managed, is reaching a peak of activity in the African continent. So I would like to give you the floor, Elizabeth, to describe to us some of what you think are the challenges and the opportunities. I give you the floor. <coughs> start after Dr. Olivia has <laughs> talked and after Mama Ju has said something, but I think the reality is that we are farmers on the ground. We are practical on daily basis. We are facing challenges. And what should we do about those challenges? I'm not going to repeat what he has been talking of investment in agroecology. Agro as they say, but basically, let me start by talking what challenges we are facing as Moscow farmers in the global arena. We are talking of land grabbing. If we want to talk more on food sovereignty, how are we going to achieve if our land is being grabbed away from us? It's a big challenge. We might do the campaigns whatsoever, but if we don't have the land, we are wasting our time. Mm -hmm. Let's talk of the seeds. They're now talking of harmonized seed loss. What does that mean to a farmer? 
what are the effects of those harmonized seed laws, especially in our African continent, that we already decided to sign for those harmonized seed laws. Imagine our regional bodies, which we think they are standing for the, for the farmers' rights. Already they've turned back there against the small-scale farmers, the SADC, the COMESA. They are more negotiating about these harmonized seed laws, which means our own indigenous seeds are not going to be allowed to be seen whatsoever. They are promoting the GMO seeds. They are talking of the um, trade issues on whose behalf, on whose interest, these are multinational corporates. Where are we going? But as La Via Cambacina, we are not going to stand down and think someone will have to fight for us. But together, with you people here, which I have witnessed today, listening to what you were also talking in the morning, what we are doing, the campaigns we are doing, together we will win. We should really be thankful to Dr. Olivia. This is my third time meeting with him, but wherever he is, he's so supporting our initiatives. We know there are challenges of the climate change, If our governments really want to invest in agriculture, why can't they think of also give the financial resources to the small scale farmers to do their own research? And also to promote the technologies. We know we can do it like agricultural farming systems. But you find out these huge amounts of money is, is being given to research institutions which are biased to the media sectors which doesn't even cover our own histories of farming systems, our own traditional knowledge of farming so I think, ladies and gentlemen, we have a big role to play in campaigning for our rights. And even to tell the UK government that we really need those funding partners to support the small-scale farmers in whatever initiative they are doing. We know we are not being recognized globally, that we are taken to be people who don't know what they are doing. We could not produce but the majority of the food producers are in the rural areas, especially in Africa. And a bigger percentage, we are the women who are producing more food. 70% of the food is being produced by women. But when it comes also to leadership, very few women are given that opportunity to lead the process. That is another challenge. Now, as Patrick has just introduced the, the coming of the IOS of La Via Cambastra in Zimbabwe, I think there was a big reason why that decision was made. My organization, Zimbabwe Smallholder Organic Farmers Forum, is very new and very little. But the reason is because of something which other people don't like to hear, the issue of land reform which took place in Zimbabwe. Because 
we have been hearing, you have been hearing so many stories regarding the land reform, land distribution, which happened in Zimbabwe. Some might think, okay, that was not the, the way it should have been done. But I know it was a radical thing. Yes, totally it was so radically performed. Why? Because after the war, our president took time thinking that the negotiations were going to be exercised. But after 20 years, we thought, okay, it's now high time. Our fellows died, our comrades died, our brothers, our sisters. Then it, that was the decision made by the people themselves just to go and occupy the land. And what do you think the president could have done? There was no option rather than to support. And now, hearing so many stories in the world, Lafia Kambasina, looking at how people are now being taken away from their land and the land being given to the investors, there was now need to support the farmers in Zimbabwe to showcase. It was not so easy because we had some international delegations from La Via Cambacina, from Mexico, Brazil, from USA, coming to Zimbabwe to witness exactly that they are farmers who got their pieces of land. Although we didn't get enough support from the government to till the land, but we are managing. That is why we are saying we will struggle, we will fight against the land grabbers in Africa and at global level. I think I'm not going to waste much time. A lot has been said by Dr. Uh, Olivia. But lastly, I think it was my great opportunity. And I would emphasize, <coughs> as many as you are, let's go on the ground. Let's mobilize more organizations. Come together, build a very big network. Then look at the campaigns we are moving towards through. I know there are farmers here, although they are not going to have time to talk, but they are there. They have issues which are pending. We are together, ladies and gentlemen. Let's fight together until we win. Our <laughs>